This episode of Lead to Win is brought to you by Recipe for a Productive Day, a free resource to help you plan your perfect day of productivity. Get your copy at lead2.win slash recipe. So my question is, where did this come from? How did this develop in you? Where did you land on these tools? How did you get here? My very first executive coach was Daniel Harkavy, who has since become a dear friend and is the co-author with me of the book Living Forward. But Daniel had me, as part of my very first session, uh, coaching session with him, take the DISC test, D-I-S-C, and each one of those stands for, you know, a personality axis in that system. And I found that so helpful that, you know, I promptly had all my team take that test because it was helpful for me for self-awareness, but then I was just naturally curious to find out what everybody else was, what their profile was, so I could better understand them, better serve them, better lead them. You know, since that time, I, I discovered the, the Myers-Briggs test. And then when I was in the publishing business, I published Marcus Buckingham, and he was a strengths finder guy. And then Sally Hogshead, the fascination, you know, thing that she does. And so there's a gazillion tests out there, but I am always a sucker for a new personality test. <laughs> Because like, there's so some some aspect of my personality that I want to understand, you know, the missing key. But I found that people love these things. People love finding out more about themselves. They they try to understand what makes them tick, and these things have the promise of of helping you explore that. Hi, I'm Michael Hyatt. And I'm Megan Hyatt Miller. And this is Lead to Win, the weekly podcast to help you win at work and succeed at life. And in this episode, we're talking about understanding how your team members think, feel, and work. And the idea is pretty simple. If you want to lead people, you got to understand people. Megan, I know you love this topic. Why? Um, it's an area of serious geekery for me. <laughs> and I think sometimes our team is probably like secretly rolling their eyes behind the scenes because I talk about it so much. But I love it for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think self-awareness is really important, but really challenging. And so these tests for leaders help us to understand ourselves and where we're going to get in our own way and where we have um, you know, natural opportunity kind of built into our hard wiring. So I think from, from the perspective of self-awareness, they're really helpful. Also, as a leader, you can't just stop with your own self-awareness. You have to be emotionally intelligent in your dealings with other people, particularly those that you're leading. And it's easy to kind of sell people short, you know, or put them in a box without a more thorough way of understanding them. And so these assessments help me as a leader, um, and I think you too, Dad, to understand our team, appreciate them, coach them in a more sophisticated, uh, nuanced way, and really bring out their best in their performance and contribution to the company. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'm eager to dive into this at a little deeper level. And we've brought back Larry Wilson, our senior writer, to lead us through this conversation because he's done such a great job. He has. So Larry, take it away. Hey, thank you. Personality assessments and the tools that we're going to talk about today, three tools that that help you understand your teammates, these are a full-blown thing at Michael Hyatt. Like basically a religion. (laughs) Not quite, but it's close to that. One click back. (laughs) Only one. Okay, so we're going to talk about three of the personality profile tools that we use here at Michael Hyatt & Company. And let's get into the first one, which is the Strengths Finder profile. So, some people may f- be familiar with this th- due to the book that you mentioned, you published, Michael. Yep. Now Discover Your Strengths by Marcus Buckingham. Yeah. Some people may not know it. What is the Strengths Finder? Uh, I should also say that there's a newer version called Strengths Finder 2.0. The Strengths is plural, Strengths Finder 2.0, which is the book we tend to use. But basically, the, the tool is designed to find out where you're strong. And, and when the first time I heard this from Marcus, I thought, what? I mean, my, my experience in the corporate world up until that point was that every employee review, you know, all of our focus on people development was help people overcome their weaknesses, help them identify their weaknesses, identify, and we used to call these euphemistically, uh, opportunities for improvement, <laughs> right? 
which meant here's my criticism of your performance and I want you to, to fix this. And what Marcus said is that when people focus on their weaknesses, they can only make marginal improvement. When people focus on their strengths, they can make major contributions. And so that's a big paradigm shift. That's a big paradigm shift. So it, what I did is I went from expecting everybody to be well-rounded and good at everything to saying, forget that. Not, not, no one, including me, is going to be good at everything. There's only a few things that I can be strong at, and that's where the focus of my effort needs to be. So this helps us really before we hire somebody, but it also helps us in developing people is to find out what they naturally are strong at, to focus on that and give them opportunities to express that strength within the workplace, then we're a stronger company. It also gives people permission to think of their job as making their greatest contribution in their area of strength within our company. We also see this with our clients when we're encouraging people, for example, to delegate. This strengths-based mindset is really the foundation for giving yourself permission to delegate because there's no point in doing things if you have the option where you're not naturally strong. It's going to take far more effort. You're probably not going to be very good at it. Um, And that's kind of how we operate operate within our company, that we want people focused on making their contribution through their strengths, not through improving their weaknesses. Okay. So the Strengths Finder profile helps you identify your strengths. And you guys obviously have taken the profile. So Michael, what are your strengths? Well, first of all, there's 34 strengths uh, that you get tested for when you take the Strengths Finders test. And then they deliver back to you. The standard test, the one that comes in the book in Strengths Finders 2.0, gives you your top five strengths. I really recommend, and you can do this on the Gallup uh, site. Gallup owns this test. You and can. We'll, we'll put a link in the show notes to that. Yes, yeah. I, I would. I would encourage people who can afford it to pop for the full test. I think it's less than a hundred dollars. I think it's like seventy nine dollars. Yeah, so it gives you all thirty four of these, including your bottom five. And that's very illuminating. That's very illuminating. <laughs> But my top five are these. Achiever, people that know me aren't, aren't surprised by that. Uh, intellection, which means that I have the ability to think in um, mental frameworks and models and, you know, uh, trying to reduce things to make them simple to understand. Strategic, you know, how do we get from here to there? Futuristic, very easy for me to uh, put myself in the future and, and to kind of envision a different reality. And then I actually love this one. This one has saved me numerous times, is Relator. Hmm. So I just, I naturally like people and relate to people and relationships are really important to me. Do you happen to recall or do you want to share your bottom five? Well, I can tell you my very bottom one, which is adaptability, (laughs) which is kind of funny, but it explains a lot. So what's really funny about it is it's Gail's number one strength. Actually, it's not her number one strength. It's in her top five. Her top one is positivity, but adaptability is in her top strength. So she's happy to throw plans out the window and and just do something completely different. When I'm on a course, do not try to change my plans. You know, I'm, I I could become very rigid in that. And, and I think part of my spiritual discipline over the last, you know, 35 years having a family and particularly five girls has been to get more flexible and get more adaptable. Kids that, have a way of doing this to you, whether you want to or not. They do. And it's just not natural my bent. And I know Megan has the same issue. That's not, it's one of her greatest weaknesses too. It's my last one. Is it? Yeah, Let's start list. with your strengths, okay. Megan. <laughs> In the spirit of this episode, that's right. So my number one strength is futuristic. So my dad and I share a lot of these in common. Uh, number two for me is relator. Number three for me is strategic. Number four is activator, which means I like to just take action, take action, take action. Uh, and then number five is achiever. So my bottom one. We share four of five. I think we do. That's right. Yeah. And probably more than that in our top 10. My bottom ones are my very last one, number 34, adaptability. Uh, number 33, so going in reverse order here, is includer, which means I'm kind of always looking for the – or rather, I'm not always looking for the people kind of on the fringes and trying to pull them in. My mom is really good at that. That's not me. Harmony, also not something I'm great at. You know, I don't mind causing conflict to get to a good solution. I've noticed this about you. Yeah, right. Uh, context, like I don't need all the details. Again, it's kind of like I want to activate. Um, and then woo, somebody who's just super, super, super charismatic is, is woo. So that's my number 30 strength. So those are my lower ones. Now, let me ask you a question about using this in a work context. So you know your top strengths, you know, or have access to everyone's top strengths. In fact, we put this on the website mm-hmm. for, right. the, for the team. Right. So we all know each other's strengths. Is there a danger of pigeonholing people here? 
I don't think so with the strengths finder test in particular, because none of these are necessarily better or worse for anything. I mean, That's right. it's just kind of like shades of color, you know, it, it helps to give dimension to people, but it's not um, predictive of their performance necessarily or anything like that. It just tells you um, some things about them that are helpful in terms of where their strengths are. I, I think it's also helpful when you're building an organization to make sure that you're including diversity at this yeah, level, absolutely. diversity of strengths. And so we literally map these in a spreadsheet so that we we know whether we're getting too heavy. Like if you, if you have a, had an organization of all achievers, you would have an organization that is exhausted. Right. You know, that's trying to do too much, that just wears everybody out. We so have, you, for example, three out of five of our executive team members have achiever in their top five strengths, but yeah. two don't. Right. And so that's, you know, we don't need to be hiring somebody else with that uh, in the top five, or at least we should consider it carefully before mm-hmm. before we do that. But for example, uh, communication is one of the, the strengths. And so, you know, Susie on our team has that as one of her top yep. strengths. She's maybe, our director of operations. Maybe her top one. So oftentimes we'll one. say to ourselves- would you, would you define communication in this context? Because this as a strength may mean something different than what People yeah, think. so she has a, a unique ability to communicate vision, to align people, to get everybody on the same page, to effectively articulate ideas to others. And part of her role uh, in operations working for me is that she's charged with our communication strategy internally. So how that works cross-functionally. How do people communicate with one another? What are the barriers that she needs to overcome? She naturally is gifted at seeing those kind of solutions. Well, the interesting thing too is, is she started it as my executive assistant. And one of the things that was difficult for me to, in turning over my email inbox was I thought nobody could respond as well as I could respond. You know, that, that whoever I delegate this to can't, won't be able to understand the nuances of communication, when to be firm, when to be generous, when to be kind. And then I started reading Susie. I, I did, took a leap of faith. Then I started reading Susie's responses to people. And I said, oh my gosh. She's saying it's so much better than I would have said it. She's super emotionally intelligent. Yep. So that's a good example of with Susie, how knowing somebody's strengths, their top five strengths, enables us to position them to make their greatest contribution to the company and also to have the greatest satisfaction in their role. I mean, Susie loves figuring out communication for Michael Hyde and company because she's so darn good at it naturally. Well, and in fact, we're having a team retreat next week, mm-hmm. and we're going to be communicating some things about you know our vision for this year and and what it is we're out to do this year to our entire team and their spouses. And Susie's in charge of putting together at least the initial part of that uh, communique, you know, the slide deck and everything else that we're going to be using. Right. So, as a leader, if you're going to lead people, you have to understand people. One tool for doing that is the Strengths Finder profile. A second tool is the Enneagram. What is it? Enneagram, you know, comes from two Greek words, which mean basically nine words or nine sayings. And so there's nine archetypes in this system. So type one is what's often referred to as the reformer, sometimes pejoratively referred to as a perfectionist. But this is the person who likes to have all things in order and as close to perfect as, as possible. Type two is called the helper. And this is the person that just naturally sees what needs to be done, loves to pitch in, loves to help other people, loves to love people. Type three is the achiever. That's what I am. Person that just naturally likes to be productive, likes to achieve things, likes to check off lists. Then there's uh, number four, sometimes called the individualist or the romantic or the artist. But uh, Megan, you are a four, so is there anything you want to say about that? Yeah, I think the idealist is a, a good way to think of it, too. You know, you're, you're constantly thinking about uh, what's missing, what's, you know, kind of the romantic ideal of things, of very concerned with aesthetics, beauty, literature, those sorts of things. Okay. And then number five, which Joel, your husband is, the investigator. You know, these are people that just love to learn, love lots of input, love arranging intellectual ideas and so forth. Uh, number six, the loyalist, and this is a person who is very loyal, somebody who uh, oftentimes doesn't want to take a leadership role, but has a lot of friends and is there to defend their friends when they get into trouble. Number seven is the enthusiast. Um, I think Gail has finally settled on this as her type, but this is somebody who does have a positive outlook in life and who generally loves adventure. And then number eight is the challenger, 
And this is the person who, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is a good example of that, somebody who stands for justice, wants fairness, is looking out for the well-being of other people. And then number nine is called the peacemaker. And this is the person who doesn't like conflict, loves to create harmony in an organization, and is generally the, the person that everybody else wants to, to be like because they're so darn likable. Okay, and I just want to point out for people who are listening to the program, none of these top strengths for the Strengths Finder, the, the Enneagram profile, you haven't got these written down in front of you. You just know this about <laughs> we know yourselves we and each other and people who work in the organization. Right. I try to, to know at least with pretty good accuracy what uh, the top five strengths are of each of my direct reports and really a lot of other people in the organization um, that I'm working with regularly, as well as their Enneagram type and what that means. Um, and then some other things we'll get into later. I think that's really helpful. Talk about that. How, how does it help you in being a leader? One of the things that I think leaders know how to do or need to know how to do is speak to specific audiences. And so I know that if I'm talking to Chad, who's our chief marketing officer, whose number one strength is competition and is an eight on the Enneagram, which is the challenger, that there are ways that I need to speak so that he'll hear me about opportunities or things I want him to focus on to really get him engaged that would be different from how I would speak to Justin, who's our CFO, who's a nine on the Enneagram. And I think harmony is his number one strength. So he's really concerned with avoiding conflict, keeping the peace, being kind of a steady hand, wants everybody to be on the same page. So if I want to motivate him or talk about an issue with him, I'm going to frame that so differently if I'm talking to Justin versus Chad, because they're so different. And if I don't know that, I'm not going to be very effective as a leader. Yeah. You could say, for example, something to Chad that would crush Justin's spirit. Right. You know, and conversely, you could say something to Chad in a way that you would speak to Justin that wouldn't even make him notice. He'd forget about it. And neither, and this is really important to say, there are no right or wrong yes. personalities or strengths or any other profile. I mean, they're they're all equally valuable. They're just different. And I think being able to adjust your approach as a leader um, is greatly informed by this information. You, you know, one metaphor that might help here, I see myself as a leader as like a symphony conductor. And so I want to make sure that I know who the violins are, who the saxophone players are, you know, all those different instruments, because it takes all that to make a beautiful, you know, symphony and to create a beautiful concert. And so my job is to call them up at the appropriate time, whatever fits the situation. But I can't do that if I don't know what the strengths are and what the, you know, uh, the color and the tone and all of that of those different instruments. So I've got to be informed as a conductor. Interesting to hear how you use the Enneagram and other tests. I had a chance to talk with Ian Cron, who is the author of the book, The Road Back to You. Our favorite resource on this topic, yes. by the way. Fantastic book and pretty much required reading here at Michael Hyatt That's and right. Company with good reason. And uh, I asked him uh, about mistakes people may make in using the kind of information that you get from these profiles, especially the Enneagram. Here's what he said. The most common mistake I think that people make when they're using the Enneagram is to assume that if you know someone's type, you actually know them. And that's not true. No personality assessment can account for the mystery and the depth uh, of a human being. I actually have a list of what I call Enneagram ethics. Number one, you never want to weaponize your knowledge of another person's type to dismiss or ridicule them. You want to create a safe environment where people can be known, but where that knowledge isn't being turned against them. So you never want to hear in a, a team setting things like, oh, you know, stop acting like such a four or a six. That's weaponizing information about other people that uh, makes for an unsafe work environment. Secondly, don't like, for example, use your type as an excuse for bad behavior or to, to justify resistance to not growing beyond its limitations. Sometimes you'll hear someone say something like, uh, I can't help being overly blunt. You know, I'm an eight, just deal with it, right? That's, that's an unhealthy or unhelpful way to use the Enneagram in a corporate setting or a leadership setting. Never tell another person what type they are. 
I would say also never use your knowledge of someone's type to manipulate or, or exploit them, uh, which could happen in some settings. So I think there are mistakes that all of us can make uh, when we use personality assessments, and we have to be on guard as leaders to make sure that the, the knowledge that we've gleaned about ourselves and others isn't misused. Well, I love what Ian had to say because we certainly try to practice those ethics of how we apply personality information within our company. Um, But an important distinctive with the Enneagram is this is not a tool that we particularly use in hiring. That can be a way that you really can pigeonhole people uh, that's damaging and unhelpful. And so what we tend to do is use it as a means of personal and professional development after people are on our team as a way of understanding each other, as a way of growing individually. Um, But it's not something that we focus on during the hiring process. Sometimes people know that this is a test that we use a lot, and so they'll volunteer that information when they apply for a position. And, And we just take that really with a grain of salt because the truth is any number can be successful in any position. There there are not um, certain numbers that are uh, sort of pre-qualified for like executive roles, for example. There can be great success and diversity uh, within that kind of a position. So we don't want to let that color our judgment. You know, you know, one of the things I want to speak to is the whole idea of empathy. And I think that one of the great benefits of the Enneagram from my perspective is it helps me understand why people do what they do and creates empathy for them. So rather than dismissing them or ridiculing them, as Ian was talking about, it makes me think, oh, they have a different perspective. They have a a different way that they're wired. And that's good because it expands my perspective. So I think it's not only for the people development, but I think there's a net gain for the organization when we all understand those numbers because we can appreciate. You can't appreciate what you don't understand. Totally agree. Hey, everyone, Mike Boyer here. If you're enjoying this episode on the power of personality, you're going to love the free resource we have for you today, your personality jumpstart. With this free guide, you'll learn how you can use three highly effective personality assessments to understand your team and grow your business. It's yours free in today's show notes at lead2.win. Download it now. And a special shout out goes to AM Roberts 14, who left this five star review for the podcast on iTunes. Lead to win? A treasure. It's my leadership lifeline. We're so glad to know that this content is helping you grow. If you have a friend who could benefit from this great content, why not share the episode in your favorite social channel and tag them? I know they'll be glad you did. And now, back to the show. Well, to lead people, you need to understand people. And one tool for that is the Strengths Finder profile. A second is the Enneagram. And that's going to bring us to our third tool, which is the Colby A Index. Now, this one is probably the least well-known of the mm-hmm. ones that we're talking about here today. I had a chance to visit with Amy Bruski, who is the president of Colby Corporation, and ask her a little bit about the Colby A Index. And it really has to do with helping people understand how they work, and how to get things done. And let's listen to part of what she had to say. Well, the reason that really smart people and very capable people don't get much done is that there's so much more to productivity than just your ability to do something. It's not all about how smart you are. There's really three different dimensions to people being productive. There's What are you capable of, which falls under this thinking part of the mind? What are your skills and your knowledge and your intelligence? What can you do? The next dimension of the mind is all about what do you want to do? It's this personality side of you or the feeling part that's about what do you value, what do you care about, and what are you motivated to do? And then this third dimension is about doing. It is really how do you most naturally get things done? And we find that where all three of these play together, that's where someone has a sweet spot and is most productive. Just being capable, if you don't really care about what it is and you're not motivated, it's not gonna happen. The same is true if you're doing part of you, has a specific need to do things in a certain way and you're not able to operate that way, we find long-term, you're gonna be stressed out, you're gonna burn out in your role, so there's gotta be a fit there too. So we've talked a little bit about the head part, what you're good at, the heart part, who you are as a person. The Colby A index is really about the hands, is how you actually do things. Uh, So tell us a little bit more about this index and how it works. 
Well, the Colby Index measures how you initiate work. So if you think about getting started on a project, how are you going to get started? And you may not have ever thought about that before because it's so innate that whatever way you initiate seems like universal, but it's it's not. There are actually four different indices that someone can initiate work. So number one is called fact finder. So that's the person who is going to initiate work by researching. Then there's follow through, which is someone who is going to initiate work by planning. Uh, Uh, Then there's quick start, which is someone who's going to initiate work by taking action and figuring that out along the way. And finally, there's implementer, which is all about physically touching something and initiating work through kind of an orientation through your physical senses. Tell me a little bit about how this helps you to lead people. I, I think different roles require different ways of initiating work. And so, for example, I'm a quick start. You know, my Kobe profile is such that quick start is my highest or, as Colby calls it, the longest number. And I'm an eight in that, which means that I like risk and I like getting started. And and I I like to say my motto is ready, fire, aim. So (laughs) do something, you know, get the car in motion and then we'll steer it and figure out where we're going to go. But what I need is not more quick starts around me, particularly people like my executive assistant, Jim, is not long on quick start. He's long on follow through. So he's able to take what I delegate to him and make sure that it actually gets done because I don't have a lot of energy around staying with the project to completion. I'm great at starting. I'm not great at finishing. But if I build my organization in a way that I've got people around me that are good at finishing, then projects get done. And so this is where you have to be intelligent in using Colby and building your organization and bringing the right people in. And one of the things that we've discovered is that it's a great predictor of whether or not somebody's going to be successful in a role. In fact, I'm going to ask you, Megan, to explain the Colby Right Fit program because yes. you're right in the middle of this right now with a couple of candidates. I love this profile so much. So um, in fact, this is the only assessment that I know of that has some kind of a predictive algorithm attached to it. So essentially, as a hiring manager, you would take a test on yourself. So you know what your score is and how you like to initiate work. Then you would fill out one based on the job description of a position you want to hire. So what you think um, a a new position is going to require, and this is all done through, you know, multiple choice assessment. So it's not descriptive. It it is scoring it automatically. And then the, the candidates that you're considering will also take an assessment on themselves. Then what happens is all the, those three assessments get sent to Colby and they run it through an algorithm that they call a right fit. And so there is a, an ideal range of success that they call it that is ba- for a position that's based on the uh, Colby profile of the hiring manager and the profile of the position that they've done. So you automatically know know what you're looking for in someone. So then when you get candidates who apply, and we usually do this um, kind of in the later stages of our hiring, well, not later, kind of the middle of our hiring process. So now we're, we've gone from initial screening interview to we're ready to meet this person. We want to know before we meet someone in person, are they a potential right fit? And so we send their results to Colby, which, you know, again, through the algorithm will tell you whether or not they're a right fit or, or what they call, um, you know, with in that range of success. So they give them a letter grade. Um, and generally speaking, we don't interview anyone past that kind of initial stage of hiring that is not at least an A. And the reason for that is, and so you can be like an A minus, an A, an A plus. The reason for that is we want people for roles um, who are naturally hardwired to have the energy they need to succeed in those roles. And I think your example of Jim, your executive assistant, my executive assistant, Jamie, um, is very similar to Jim in this way. They both initiate action through follow through. So they're good at details and planning and being thorough. You and I are not good at that. Right. Um, that's not where we have natural energy. We can do it, but it's exhausting. And so when you match someone um, who has natural energy for a role with a position, you have someone who is from the get go hardwired to succeed. And that's a win for you and them. Have you ever hired somebody contrary to the right fit 
recommendation on what the result's <laughs> been? I kind of know the answer to this. Uh, <laughs> yes, I have a few times. Um, and, you know, one spectacular case when I absolutely went in the opposite direction of the Colby because I thought I was smarter. I thought that um, my own algorithm in my head knew what this position needed, even though it was contrary to that ideal range of success. Um, and it was a disaster. You know, it was it was unfortunate because not only was the person we put in the position unable to succeed, but it was really a setup to fail from the beginning um, because he was just not naturally equipped to do the kind of work that we needed in that role, which involved taking a lot of risk, um, kind of forging ahead, pioneering into uncharted territory. And he was a person who really liked to have a plan and have it really well thought out. And that was just not going to happen in that role. So it was a setup to fail from the beginning. You know, a book on this, Larry, that I want to recommend is uh, Kathy Colby, who invented this assessment. She's got a book called Striving Zones. And in that book, Striving Zones, she explains what all this means. So that's a great resource. Interesting fact, too, is her father, I believe, Mm -hmm. developed the Wonderlick assessment, which is the one that uh, that measures intelligence, you know, an IQ test. So she comes from a a lineage there. It's kind of in her DNA, self-assessments. What was the subtitle to that book, Michael? Do you remember it? The Striving Zone? Yeah, the subtitle to Striving Zones is How People Act When Free to Be Themselves. Mm. And the title of Ian Cron's book about the Enneagram, The Road Back to You. Mm. And so much of what we talked about here today is about helping people thrive in the ways that they are naturally gifted and equipped and not putting square pegs in round holes and expecting a good result from that. Well, and I, I believe, I mean, this is a fundamental presupposition for me. I, I believe that God has designed everybody in a unique way. Everybody has certain strengths, certain talents, certain natural instincts that if we can sort of unpack and begin to understand that design, we have a much higher probability of putting them in a place where they can win, both for themselves and for the organization. And, and a large part of my role as a leader, I think, is to deploy these people that frankly, I believe God has given to us and I have to be a steward, uh, to deploy them in a way that lets them shine and lets them be really fulfilled and lets them have the, the, the greatest chance of succeeding. And as a team member, I can tell you, it's a great thing to get paid for what you want to do anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what we hope. Yeah. Well, today we've learned that if you want to lead people, you need to understand people. And there are three simple personality assessments that you can use to understand how your team thinks and feels and initiates work. They are the Strengths Finder, the Enneagram, and the Colby A Index. So any final thoughts today, guys? As a leader, if you're looking to take your uh, self-awareness and your emotional intelligence to the next level, uh, that can often be daunting, you know, because it's sort of like, what do you do to grow in those areas? Doing these assessments first on yourself and then on your team and exploring how you can apply them with nuance and um, care and sophistication is a great practical way to grow in these areas. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that as enthusiastic as I am about these, and for people that are prone to action who are listening to this may want to roll out all three in their organization, I think that's a quick way to get bogged down and create a lot of confusion. So I would do these one at a time. When when we've done it, we've associated them with team training so that uh, our team understands what they are. We, we brought in the head of Colby, for example. We brought in Ian Cron, but not at the same time. You know, these were like uh, a quarter apart. And so I would, I would get some facility with the particular one you're going to start with, and then I would learn that and then bring in another one. And if I were going to start anywhere, I'd probably start with Colby. Megan, you may disagree with this. I agree with you. It's the most I'd, practical. Yeah, I'd, go, I'd start with Colby, and then probably I'd go to Strength Finders and then to Enneagram. Enneagram is going to be the most in-depth. And by the way, you could read all these for yourself you know, at the same time, but I just wouldn't deploy them in your organization all at the same time. It's a good word. Very good thought. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And thank you guys for joining us on Lead to Win. We invite you to join us next week for a new episode. Until then, Lead to Win. This episode of Lead to Win has been brought to you by Recipe for a Productive Day 
a free resource to help you plan your perfect day of productivity. Get your copy at lead2.win slash recipe.